But we do want to welcome Brother Roger back. And uh, welcome back, brother. And he's doing great in his healing process. Yeah, give him a hand. <laughs> Amen. You know, Sister Katie's been, been um, coming back. She comes into evening services for now, but she's doing great. And, uh, you know, whatever life throws at us, we have more than enough power and strength in us to get through it. Yes. Amen. We just got to keep on trucking and, and, and stick together. And so um, let's pray over the word. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, that this word will find a home in each and every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And so I wanted to start off by reading a passage of scripture and uh, I have it on my phone here. John 8, 21 through 30. This is the New Living Bible, if you'd like to follow along. John 8. Thank you for coming this morning. This is where we settle in, right? Settle in and... Um, take a deep breath. I should have had everybody stand up and shake it off a little bit, but you'll be all right, right? <laughs> take a deep breath, and um, sometimes when it comes to the spiritual things, there's a, there's a resistance to it because our mind likes, likes what it likes sometimes. So just keep your mind alert. Put your heart um, into learning what God has for you today, and you'll be blessed by it. And so in John 8... I wanted to read the words from Jesus, uh, verse 21. It says, later Jesus said to them again, I am going away. You will search for me, but will die in your sin. You cannot come where I am going. And the people asked, is he planning to commit suicide? What does he mean? You cannot come where I am going. And Jesus continued, you are from below, I am from above, you belong to this world, I do not. That is why I said that you will die in your sins. <clears throat> For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they demanded. And Jesus replied, the one I have always claimed to be. I have much to say about you and much to, much to condemn, but I won't. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truthful. But they still didn't understand that he was talking about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the Father taught me. And the one who sent me is with me, he has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Then many who heard him say these things believed in him. And so this is a, a passage of scripture where Jesus is talking to those people that are, are resisting him. They're rebelling against him. The, the religious Jewish leaders of the day, and he's, look, he's saying, look, because you don't believe in me, you'll die in your sins. It's a terrible thing for someone to die in their sins. But thankfully for you, I came to preach the good news, the gospel. You don't have to die in your sins. That's why Jesus came. And, and the title of my message this morning is Nothing But the Blood. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus that cleansed our sins and that washed us whiter than snow. And the blood of Jesus that brought us to a heavenly father. That's what we're celebrating here today. And I thought before I do my message... I wanted, I wanted the, um, them to play uh, the song, Nothing But the Blood. How many of you from yesteryears gone by remember that song? Can you raise your hand? Amen. Now, these, this is an old traditional song, but you know what? Those songs are very, very anointed, too. We, we have never <clears throat> in any way say we're, we're, we're done with those songs. Those songs like Amazing Grace, How Great Thou Art. Come on now. I think Amazing Grace is the, is, the, is the theme song in heaven that they sing. But this song is so precious, and it brought me back to my childhood. All those times sitting in the pew singing nothing but the blood. I bet you I've sung this song 500 times in my life. Because back in the day, I was in church Sunday morning, 
Sunday night, Wednesday, from a little lad on. And guess what? It never hurt me. It helped me. I'm thankful that my parents didn't say, well, I'll let you choose. I didn't know what I was doing to choose. They had to show me that God is worth going to church for. And they had to let that word keep coming in me and keep filling me up and renewing my mind. And they put a foundation in me, just like the Bible says, when I got older, I did not depart. Amen? I wasn't perfect. Your children aren't perfect either, and neither were you. But I'll tell you one thing, when you get it in you, it's in you. And you always know where home base is. And so I wanted to play this song and just uh, um, go back memory lane, but listen to the words of this song, Nothing But the Blood. Amen. So that's a wonderful song, isn't it? Now remember, you're part of a church congregation with many different types of people, many different generations. And so um, whatever songs we sing or whatever we do in here, we participate together. Amen. And uh, let the Spirit of God move on you. And, uh, but that song does sum it all up. Nothing but the blood. And so the word gospel, as I said earlier, means good news. It's all good news when it comes to God. You know what bad news would be to me? If someone told me there was no God. If someone told me that God doesn't love me. That'd be bad news. If someone told me that I had sinned too much, that there was no hope for me, that'd be bad news. If someone told me I had to reach a certain level in my behavior or conduct or works or something that, that I needed to do 
to, to achieve uh, uh, salvation, that would be bad news. Right? But it's good news when I tell you straight out that God loves you. Amen. And see, Christianity is different from all other religions in the world. All other religions in the world are about, a man, about man striving to be good enough to reach some high standard through righteous works so they can earn acceptance to their God or what they consider to be eternal life. That's all the other religions in the world, achieving a certain uh, stature. And the sad thing about it is that you have people that are leading these religious places and they're standing up there and, and they ain't even got there. They're acting like they did. You know, and the man likes the Lord over other men. Have you got that? Have you figured that out? And, uh, and like to be holier than thou. And you little people, one day when you achieve, now forget that. Christianity is not like that, but every other religion is, <clears throat> right? Christianity is the only religion that is about a holy God coming down to where we are. Becoming one of us in his humanity, talking about Jesus, and rescuing us from sin. Christianity is not about works. It's about love and faith, grace and mercy. It's about God reaching down to man or reaching down to us first. For God so loved the world in its lost condition that he sent someone. Who was that? His only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. No wonder it's the good news. And so that's what Christianity is about. Christianity is about man responding to God's grace with faith. It's about eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 13. <clears throat> What I love about um, this church, I love many things about this church besides the fact that God's, God brought us here, but then God put it in the hearts of my parents to, to um, pioneer this church back in 1978. And our family came out of a lot of hardship. Our family came out of a lot of struggle. And uh, I don't know anything about any, any uh, privilege that you see people talk about. <laughs> You know, we, we went to the, to the school of hard knocks. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you know, we always had love for one another. We always stuck together. But when they found out that they had salvation through Jesus Christ, it, it became alive in them. And then they, God gave them the ability and gave them the mandate and the calling to start a church of which we are all part of. And that call on their life and that that moving in areas of faith do, did do what the Bible says it will do. It went down to generations upon generations because it went down to me and, and to my siblings and then it went down into our, our children and then into our grandchildren. It's going to continue until Jesus comes back, right? And so, but what I love so much about our, our founding pastor is that he had a hard life. And there was a lot of things that go along with having a hard life. And, and, and um, a, lot of, a lot of things that you get into in the world. And, uh, um, you know, when he, when he uh, the Lord put this church in, in his heart, he said, uh, my dad said, uh, well, who do you want me to reach? And at that time, he said, I want you to go out to where you, from where you are and go down. I want you to reach people on your level and people that are even worse off than you. And out of that mandate came a beautiful message of faith and restoration and salvation that comes by faith in Jesus. Came a beautiful uh, ministry of raising people up spiritually who would never probably make it in a, in a traditional church because they would get thrown out. But man, did, the, did God ever reach a lot of people over these 45 plus years? Amen. I mean, these people, it, it's a beautiful, this church, is, is a, it's a beautiful ministry. And I'm not saying it because I'm the pastor. I'm saying it because God's in this place. 
And we have a lot of people in here that have been forgiven much. And you know what, you know what um, Jesus said about those people? He said, those who have been forgiven much love much. Amen. Amen. And you know who else we are? We don't forget where we came from. Where we came from does not define us or hurt us, but it's still in, we still remember it's still a part of our life because we, we can never forget where God brought us from. Or else we might be one of the critical people. Or else, God forbid, we'd be a religious person. We ain't got none of that in here. What you got in here is real life passion. Real life, real life restoring human beings that have benefited from the power of God. And so, did you turn to uh, Colossians 1.13? Yeah, it's, I, said, I said Colossians. Check the tape. No, I'm no, okay. <laughs> Colossians. Yeah. <laughs> Colossians 1.13. Don't check the tape because you'll find out that I did say that. <laughs> yeah. Brother Terry's like, what's that verse have to do with this message? Nothing. <laughs> Colossians 1.13. New King James, this version is. You know, when it comes to the things of God, the more you press in, the better it gets. Have you ever met someone in the beginning you thought they might have been sort of a cool person or a nice person, but the more you got to know them, you're like, oh, okay, maybe they're not someone I really want to hang out with. Well, that's not God. (laughs) To know him is to love him, to surrender your life, and to say, God, you have all of me. I give you my permission to take me and to lead me and to guide me and to show me who you made me to be, to come to that place in your life will cause you to soar higher than you ever thought. But it has to be your choice. You have to want that. I wanted that some 20-something years ago. I wanted that with all of my heart. And guess what? God met me right where I was at. Amen. And filled me with his love, filled me with his power, filled me with his forgiveness. And then he gave me a a vision. And then with that vision came a purpose for my life. And then with that person, purpose came a passion. A passion to be the best pastor that I can be and to honor God and to be the best man of God that I can be. And so Colossians 1.13, it says, God, or he meaning God, our Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so we have redemption through what? The blood of Jesus Christ. What comes with that redemption? Forgiveness of sins. It's not just the forgiveness of sins when you become a believer. God changes your nature. He, 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 he causes you to be born again in your spirit. Amen? You are now a son or daughter of the Most High God. He's cleansed you, and he's made a way for a sinful person because the Bible says we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. He made a way for us to go to the Father cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You, you can't write a better love story than that. The Bible is a love book, isn't it? It's a love book about God's love for you. And so we've been delivered from the power of darkness, it says. Does it say we've been delivered? Does it say when you get to heaven one day, you will be delivered? You're delivered now. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been delivered from the power of darkness or the ability of sin to separate you from your holy God. You've been delivered because that's Satan's power. You've been delivered. That ought to put joy in your heart. You say, well, sometimes I don't feel like I'm saved. See, you're trying to connect with God here. Not enough word, not enough prayer, not enough spiritual things will cause you to think mental, mental, mentally, and then your mind will lie to you. Or your feelings will lie to you. 
If it doesn't say what God's word says, it's a lie. And it came from someplace. It came from the devil. Right? So that's why we got to keep renewing our minds. Every day, if you struggle with that, if you're saved or not, every day, you just look yourself in the mirror and say, I am a child of God. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we've been delivered. The word redemption means ransomed. God paid a price for us. What was that price? The life of his son, the blood of Jesus Christ. Or it means release or, de or delivered. Do you know that God has a claim on your life? Let's look at that. Look at Jeremiah 1.5, King James Version. Jeremiah 1.5, we'll see that God has a claim on your life. He cares about you. He has always cared about you. He's just as much into your life as he is into my life or anyone else. Remember when, when the prophet chose David? God said, go down and, and choose the next king. And, and the prophet was choosing all the, the big, buff-looking sons, the, the muscular ones. And, 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 and the prophet's like, well, you must be the next king. Look at you. And God's like, no, 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 no. I don't look at people the way people do. I don't look at the outside. I look at what's inside. And he said, ask that man, ask that man, Jesse, if he has another son. And he says, well, I do got a son, but he's just, he's just a little guy, and he's out with the sheep. He said, well, go get him. That was the man. Amen? God looks into your heart. If you're in here today and you've had people misjudge your heart, that's a terrible thing. God will never misjudge you. He'll never think bad of you. The scriptures tell us that. If you're struggling in any area of your life, God wants to help you. He wants to bring you up out of it and take you to places of peace and, and wholeness that comes through a relationship with him. And so Jeremiah 1.5, we're talking about God has a claim on your life. It says, this is God, before I formed thee, he's talking to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou comest forth out of the womb, I already sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So God's telling Jeremiah, I, had a, I have claims to your life. I have a plan for your life. But you know what? He has plans for you too. Amen. Look at this. He says, before I formed you in the belly. Who forms the baby in the belly? God does. Amen? Amen. All life is sacred. Every single baby that ends up in the womb of a woman came from God. And before that baby ended up in the womb, God already knew them and had plans for their life. He laid a claim to their life, beautiful plans. Yeah, we live in a fallen world and we go through hardship, but guess what? We serve a risen Savior. Isn't it something great about triumph? And overcoming adversity, doesn't that make you stronger and make you feel good? I remember some of the toughest tree jobs I had when I worked at the tree service back in the day, not recently. <laughs> but, I mean, these tough jobs, we would work all day. We'd work hard. We, we'd go into some of these properties. It, it looked like nobody lived there for 40 years. It's just people didn't do, like to do the yard work or whatever. Growing up bushes and all things, but, but after we were done with that job, I would ride back there. Sometimes I'd take the kids back there and say, see that house? I had a part, of, I had a part in that. It was a big, I had satisfaction. I had just a sense of accomplishment that that was a mess. And look what we were able to do. That's what God wants to get you through. Don't concentrate on the trials and tests and tribulations that this world offers. Concentrate on the victory and the triumph. Amen. Amen? And so I'll show you that God has a plan for all of our life because we'll use the words, the scriptures to prove it, right? Look at Ephesians 1. You could turn there. Verse 4, New Living Translation. Going back over into the New, the New Testament. These are things that everybody needs to hear. 
If you get a chance and, and you like this message, you can get a CD and you can pass it on to somebody or you could go on YouTube and watch it or Facebook and just pass it on to someone because people don't know what I'm telling you. And because they don't know, they're struggling and they're empty and they're depressed. It would be pretty depressing to live your life not knowing God. I'm just saying. Because that, mean every, that means everything you're trying to do to fill your life with something is just a Band-Aid or, or a filler. It's not, the, it's not what really takes to, to, to make you whole, and that is God, knowing God for yourself. Amen? And so Ephesians 1, verse 4, this, is, this could be like the twin to Jeremiah. It says, even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Before he made the world, he already had the plan of salvation fixed through Jesus Christ. This does not mean that, 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 God, that God handpicked everyone uh, before time and he knows who, who's, uh, that he just chose certain people to be saved. It's not what it's saying, because the Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to perish. That's why Jesus isn't back yet. God's very patient, waiting for the harvest to come in. But God does have foreknowledge. But, but salvation, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And sometimes people take an innocent scripture like this and say, well, God already, he just handpicked his people. No, salvation is for everyone. But does God have foreknowledge? Yeah, he knows everything. You know, it's impossible for God to have a light bulb moment. You know the light bulb like a cartoon? Boom, I've got a bright idea. He is the bright idea, <laughs> right? He doesn't, he's never, the lights are on, but nobody's home. He's got it all figured out. He, he, is, he is the supreme God over all. All-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent, ever-existing, a God that doesn't just have love, he is love. Amen? Amen? That's a big God we have. And so bef look at this, before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. I want to ask you this, do you see yourself as holy and without fault in God's eyes? Do you see yourself that way? Or are you thinking about the struggles and the things that you have to deal with and the ways, things about yourself that you're not so happy with? I'm talking to believers here. But Jesus died for everybody. Their sins are paid for too. They just got to know it. You have to understand God sees you as holy and without fault before him because he sees you and who you are in Christ. He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing but the blood is all it takes. You have to know that. So therefore, when you struggle or have problems, you'll go to God and get the help that you need instead of running from him because the devil will beat you up. He'll beat you up in your mind. I'm reading to you what the scripture says. Yeah, Mr. Religious or Mrs. Religious will try to tell you a different story. They don't know what the Bible says. We're reading it for ourselves, right? Even before the, God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Look at verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. That's what we ought to praise God for every day. Amen? Amen? I've been around a while. I can say that because I said that earlier. I've been around a while. I'm the son of a pastor. And I know how the devil works. And he gets you thinking you're not really saved or else you wouldn't do that or you wouldn't do this or you're not really. No, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are born again in the spirit. Now you got to get your mind right. And you got to stop doing the things of the world because the things of the world ain't doing it for you. It can't. Learn, out, learn about who you are in Christ. I was 35 years of age when I finally realized that, or 30-something years of age when I finally got my mind right and got my heart right and got on in tune with God. I did not have to wait that long. I could have done it right out of high school. 
But God was waiting on me. And you got a lot of people out there that are saying, God, when I get good enough, I'm coming. When I get good enough, I'm coming to church. I feel like a hypocrite if I come to church. Why? You, you need to come to church. If that was the standard, we're all hypocrites. <laughs> That's not the standard. Come on now. I, I didn't come to be religious. The standard is, God, I want you. I want to know more about you. So uh, a logical step in that process, let me get up and, and, and go to church. Let me get up and do what you asked me to do in your word. Let me trust that you will put something in me and knowledge and strengthen me, and, and I'll begin to know you more and know more about myself and who it is you made me to be. That's, the, that's what we need to do, right? There's a lot of people waiting on God are waiting to achieve a certain level. And God's like, I'm here. I've loved you since before the foundation of the world and made a way for you in Christ before you were even in your mother's womb. And I'm waiting on you. And God says, don't make me wait any longer. Hook up with me and go, go with me, right? Look at verse six. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Verse 7, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. That's so good. It has to be read again. Amen. I'm giving you good stuff here. Amen. There was someone that came to our church a long time ago out of a religious establishment. And they said, that's a pretty good church, but, but they're too close to God in there. Oh, I'm close with God. Trust me. I'm close with his son because his son is the only person who has ever died for me. Amen. And not only that did he die for me, he lives for me. Oh, I'm best friends with the Holy Spirit. He has been my companion through all of life's trials and tests and tribulations. He has been my anchor, just like Jesus said he would be. Oh, I'm close to God. Notice how I didn't say I'm perfect. All I said was I'm close to God. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that tries to find fault in people. He's the one that picks at people. He's the one that tries to tear people down. He's the accuser of the brethren. I don't want no part in that. I don't want no part in, in talking bad about anybody. I don't want, I don't want to... I don't want to be anybody's garbage can to dump their stuff into me. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 7. This is the one we got so good we got to read again. God is so poor in kindness. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Just wanted to get your attention here. God is so rich. He's rich. In what? Kindness. Oh, he's so, so kind. In the Bible, God says, I am God and I do not change. If I was kind back then, I'm still kind today. You know why God doesn't change? He doesn't need to change. He's perfect. Right? He is so rich in kindness and grace. That's unmerited favor. He just loved us when we couldn't even love ourselves. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he did what? Purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Either that's true or it's not. Either that's true right now or it's not. It's true. Amen? Jesus died on that cross. The Bible says he, he who knew no sin became sin. Our sin was put on him so that we could become the righteousness of God. Look at this verse 8. It gets better. Or as uh, someone might say, it gets gooder. Verse 8. He has showered his kindness on us. Does it say, does it say he, he just... Dabbed a little, sprinkled a little bit of kindness. A little dab will do you. 
No, he turned the shower on and poured it on you. You're sitting here, and your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you were as clean as, as clean can be, unstained by anything of the world because of the blood of Jesus. I would call that a full-blown shower. He held nothing back when he sent Jesus. So you shouldn't hold anything back from him. Right? He showered us with his kindness, his kindness on us, along with all the wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. Here's God's plan, and this is the plan, that at the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. The ultimate plan is ultimately when it's all said and done, God's going to remake the earth going to remake the atmospheric heaven and then new jerusalem is coming down out of the sky and god's going to be here with us he's god is going to live with us his kingdom will be here all under the authority of jesus christ the name above all names that's the ultimate plan every human being will bow to jesus that's whether or not they do it in this lifetime or do it in the next lifetime when it's too late everybody will bow to the name above all names Amen? Look at verse 11. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose, verse 12, here, here's how we fit in. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, that's you, if you're a non-Jew, you're a Gentile, right? And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believe, someone say when you believed. When you believed, when you believed in Christ, he did something. He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. He downloaded himself into you and put his spirit in your born again spirit. Now God will speak to you from here and it will affect your mind out here. The world speaks to you out here and tries to affect your heart. Just got to learn how to tap into the things of God. The, reading the Bible is a good way. Listening to messages is a good way, right? Praising and spending time with God. Look at verse 14. The Spirit is God's guarantee. It's a down payment that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify Him. We have the Holy Spirit as our down payment that we do belong to God. We are children of God. This is God's down payment. One day, God's going God's to... Gonna, um, Re remake these bodies or, or, or bring these bodies from corruption to incorruption at the rapture and the resurrection. That's the final completion of the, the adoption process when you get your glorified body, whether it's the rapture or the resurrection. But until then, you have been adopted. He's given you a guarantee. He's given you his Holy Spirit. Now you got to walk by faith and press into the spiritual things. Amen? One day there'll be no more physical death. When Jesus comes back, that's good news, isn't it? Now, the Lord put this in my, in my, uh, in my mind here, in my, my heart, and it was like this. It, it, it's for you today. It's directly to you. Why don't you live the life God gave you instead of trying to live the life that the world gave you? Amen? Amen. It's not too late to turn it around. You've let the negative circumstances shape your thoughts and dictate your life's direction. It's not too late to turn it around. Some of my scriptures that, that we should be following, so don't turn there, Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the direction I'm to be taking. God's word is a, is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. 
Proverbs 3, 6, in all thy ways acknowledge God and he'll direct your path. You know what the issue is with a lot of people? They have not been acknowledging God in all their ways. They've been watching the world stuff on TV and in their music and in their, dare I say, TikTok or whatever else is out there. They've been all world, all world, all world, and they're walking a path that God never called them to walk on. And their minds are wide open to whatever the devil wants to put in there, however much he wants to depress them or harm them or get them into situations that they're hard to get out of. You don't have to walk that walk. You can decide today, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can decide today, in all my ways, I will acknowledge him. In all my ways. Do people acknowledge God in all their ways? A lot of people don't. And then Proverbs 3, 6, it's the same verse, but the New Living Translation says, Seek his will in all you do, and he'll show you which, which path to take. That sounds like a God that wants you to be on with him. Now, look at, let's go back over to, uh, let's go to Ephesians 1. You're already over there, right? Verse, um, verse 7, I just want to read this scripture again. This is King James Version. What have we gained through the blood of Jesus Christ? We've gained unmerited favor. Grace. Amen? That means you didn't earn it. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, the riches of his grace. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 12. Ephesians 2, verse 12. This is New Living Translations, Ephesians 2, 12. It says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Verse 13, but now... You have been united with Christ. Once you were a far away from God. But now, here's the part I want you to get. You have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. This says you have now been brought near to God through the blood of Christ. It doesn't say now you have finally achieved it. Now you have finally earned it. You've gone to church for 10 years and you, you didn't curse that much, and, and you, you didn't do some of those things you used to always do. Now you've earned it. Now you can get close to God. You got close to God. He brought you near because of the blood of Jesus Christ, your faith in Jesus. Now he made you righteous. You didn't earn it. He made you righteous. This is where a lot of religious people don't like this message because they think that people are giving, you're giving people a license to sin. No, if we're free from sin, not free to sin. We've been rescued out of darkness, out of Satan's strongholds. Amen? But if I stumble and if I fall and if I falter and if I, if I, if I allow my flesh to take over and I do these things that I'm not proud of, I'm going to go to God because I know who I am. Amen? But the thing is, you go to God to get strength and to get it right and to get it out of your life because it's trying to take you someplace where you don't belong. It's trying to crush your soul. You know what sin does? Crushes people's souls. There's a lot of believers out there with crushed souls. Let that be no one in here. Amen? You know, people don't go to heaven... Let me put it this way. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. So well, I'm going to be good and I'm, God's going to like me. <laughs> you can never be good enough on your own to go near a holy God. Remember Jesus told those people they're going to die in their sins? 
That's what's going to happen to them if they don't accept Jesus. They'll die in their sins. Then they'll go to a place called hell. Where Jesus said there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's outer darkness. It's an eternal place without God. Jesus is the only way, isn't he? One last scripture, then I'm going to close. Look at Romans chapter 8. When I try to locate people where they're at, if they know Jesus or not, I'll try to press in a little bit. Well, okay, a lot, because it's important. <laughs> but you can find out by asking them this question. If you would die today, why would God let you into heaven? And you know the answer that I get a lot? I'm a good person. Er, big X. Er. You know how some people say there's no wrong answers. That's a wrong answer. Um, I try to never hurt anybody. Er. But it is such a joy to be able to tell them, no, here's how you're going to go to heaven. You believe in Jesus. You know he's God's son. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. You know that you need a savior and you've asked him into your heart. And God will bring you near to him. He'll wash you whiter than snow, make you so clean and so pure in his sight and in your spirit. Then he'll download his spirit in you. And then you'll find out what kind of claim he has on your life, what he has for you. Because nothing you're doing on your own could ever match what God has for you. Unless you know more than God. God has plans for all of our life. I didn't know he called me to be a pastor. So I was... In my, I graduated from Raymond at 35, right? So it had been like, yeah, or I went in at 35. So around 34 or so, I just when I said I just started following God, then he said, hey, I made you to be a pastor. Floored me. I had no clue. None. Nada. How a guy could be so clueless. I'm not the only one. There's a lot of clueless people out there. But if you walk far enough away from God, the very thing that God called, if he called you to do it, it's what will give you the most joy and fulfillment because God's in it. When you, at the end of the day, you're going to stand before a holy God who formed you in your mother's womb and he has always known you. We, we should want to do what he wants and to glorify him because he wants the best for you. The world has taught you that the world is fun. The world's not fun. It's the pleasures of the flesh, but it leads to death and destruction and misery and pain. How much more do we have to see these people out there dropping like flies, looking for something that only God can give them, but nobody ever told them about Jesus. Nobody ever gave them a chance. They've been told that they come from monkeys. They're, they're, they're killing their souls. And the world offers them nothing except for pleasures of the flesh, with, with, which is lust. And the thing about lust is you're never fulfilled with lust. It always leaves you wanting more. God fills your life. What I'm doing to you this morning, uh, speaking to you, he is filling me up right now. He has given me so much joy, so much peace, so much uh, just his presence inside of me doing this that no money, no drug, nothing could ever do this for me. And it's the one thing that I would have probably chose last. If you had a whole list of job career opportunities, if I saw a pastor, I'd have put that one last. Nobody, no one that doesn't like to speak in front of people wants to be a pastor. And that's a long story, but I... But, did you go to Romans 8? Yeah. We're winding down. Romans 8, 28. Get you out of here semi on time. If you have a roast in the oven, I apologize. If it's burnt, you can come talk to me and I'll, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> right? Yep. You know what the Lord told me? He said, you know, we try to be respectful of people's times, but he says, he says don't try to rush, though. We got this week, and then before we all get together again, it'll be Sunday. You got, you got all, all week long. I want to get you filled up, get you thinking right, get you filled up, you know? 
Look at Romans 8, 28, and it says that we know that God causes everything to work for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. That scripture is often mis, uh, mistranslated, misspoken. When it says God causes everything to work together for our good, do you think that he's saying that everything that comes into your life comes from God? And he's working it, even though it's a tragedy or a hardship, he, he's just trying to teach you something through it, and, and it's going to work out. No, you live in a fallen world. Not everything that comes into your life comes from God. What this is talking about, all the spiritual things, everything that I've been telling you about this morning works together for your good. And God will, God will get you where you need to be. But you've got to be a willing participant. Look at this. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them who love God and are called according to his purpose for them that love him. We're all called. We all have a claim. He has a claim on all of our lives. But we all don't love God. Jesus said this. He said to people, he said, you've left your first love. You did love me. What went wrong? What happened? If you love someone, you're there for them. If you love someone, especially God, you're saying, God, I'm a knucklehead. Forget anything I want to do. I want to become to a place where it says that not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. God, I want this pain out of my life. I want this, I, I want this hardship out of my life. I want this, this, this emptiness out of my life, and only you can fill it. You have all of me. And you know what God says? About time. Let's go. Anybody think that God comes in and says, well, now you want to? You think God is a, I told you so, God? He's ready to go forget the past and get the future going, right? Look at verse 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. That, that jumped off the pages at me. He gave them his glory. In other words, you are God's glory Amen. on the earth. You're the shining example of a loving, gracious, kind, merciful God. We are, this, this gathering here, in this dark world that we live in, we are God's glory. Amen. Amen. We are shining beams of light to a lost and dying world. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? I'm going to ask for the uh, prayer ministers to come. And uh, what I'd like to ask, though, is this. If you're in here today and you have never made a personal decision for Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you feel like you've been gone a while and, and, and you feel this tug and this pull to come back, I want you to come up here and get prayer from these prayer ministers. I'll be up here too. I'll be up here waiting on you. And so um, tonight we have part two. Come on out for part two. Also want to let you know on Wednesday nights we have our children's programs and our youth groups. Try to make it out on Wednesday nights if you can. And um, you know, show your children that it's worth coming to church for because the world's trying to pull them out of the church. Amen. So if you need prayer of any sort, come up here. If you want to know Jesus, come up here. Have a nice Thanksgiving. Thank you. Right? Have a very nice Thanksgiving. Thank, thankful for all that God gave us. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had here this morning. Father, first of all, I thank you for all the lives that you've touched through prayer. I thank you, Lord God, for the lives that you touched as people were sitting there singing songs and worshiping you. And, and I just thank you, Lord, for touching all of our hearts today. I thank you for the word, Lord. Thank you, Father God, that you said your word would not return void. So I thank you, Lord, that it went right into the hearts of everyone here, Lord. 
And I know, Father, that everyone in here knows and believes that you love them. And they know who Jesus is. And they know how to get to him. So, Father, I thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray that you keep them safe and happy and healthy as they go about their way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.